Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the webinar. Tonight, we are honored to be having a conversation with a cardiothoracic surgeon. Um, Dr. Dudekim will be joining us from Children's National Hospital in Washington, DC. But before we begin, I just want to give a few housekeeping rules and information. Um, all attendees are in listen only mode. Um, if you cannot hear, hopefully you can read the slides. Um, to check the audio button on your personal computer to assure the sound is on, that's usually the problem. Um, please type your questions into the Q&A box at any time during the presentation. Questions will be read and answered after the conversation. Please note that Dr. Dudekem cannot answer questions about your child specifically, or as you as a patient, he's not your treating physician. So please do not ask personal um, questions because you won't be able to answer them. And finally, the PDF version of the slides as well as a recording of this presentation will be available on the Minded Little Hearts website. So before we get started, I wanna introduce everybody. I am Andrea Baer, the Executive Director here at Mended Hearts. Um, Mended Hearts and Mended Little Hearts' as mission is to inspire hope and improve the quality of life of heart patients and their families through ongoing peer-to-peer -peer support, education, and advocacy. Mended Little Hearts program serves the littlest heart patients of all, those who have congenital heart defects in their families. Tonight, we're excited because I have two wonderful moderators with me, Jody Smith, who is the National Program Director for Mended Hearts, and Marianne Mayhood, who serves on the Mended Hearts Board of Directors and is the lead coordinator for Mended Little Hearts of Washington, DC. And I would like to say all three of us, myself, Jody, and Marianne, are all moms of children with congenital heart disease. So it's personal here tonight, and we're so excited. So I'd like to introduce to you Dr. Dudekem. He comes from Children's National Hospital from the Royal, the Royal Children's Hospital in Melbourne, Australia, an institution that has led the advancement of cardio congenital heart disease care and research, performing more than 500 surgical procedures with cardiopulmonary bypass each year. He has a broad spectrum of pediatric cardiac surgery expertise with special emphasis in single ventricle congenital heart defects when one lower chamber of the heart does not develop. One area of his research portfolio includes clinical research into long-term quality of life for people who have had Fontan procedures, a critical surgical approach to adapt blood flow for people born with single ventricle heart disease. He has additional expertise in valve repair, artificial hearts, and other cardiac assist devices. Dr. Dudekum has more than 350 research publications and has obtained more than 7 million in grant funding in the past five years for work to create the first research network of Australian children and adults who have undergone the Fontan procedure. So Dr. Dudekum, thank you so much. It's an honor to have you with us tonight. And I would like to turn the conversation over to our moderators and you. Thank you so much, Andrea. And Dr. Dudekin, we're just absolutely thrilled to have you here with us tonight. I would like to just start out by finding a little bit about you. Human interest stories are always the most interesting. And what led you to become a cardiothoracic surgeon? What, was, what inspired you on the path to becoming? And you're on mute, Dr. Dudekin. <laughs> Sorry, sorry. Uh, for me, it was it was actually uh, a complete serendipity and uh, some very quick decision. Uh, believe it or not, uh, I wanted to be a start medical school because I wanted to be a, a psychiatrist, and so that, that maybe sometimes why the people are surprised that I'm still interested in things like psychology as a cardiac surgeon. But and uh, and uh, <clears throat> it became apparent very quickly to me that I wanted to be a surgeon, and then from surgeon uh, general surgery, the first year. Uh, I, I was exposed to vascular surgery. I really liked it and I, I did everything to become a vascular surgeon. Then the final year of my training, I was exposed to cardiac and I was, uh, I was excited by the technical aspect. It was one step above vascular surgery for me. So I went for, for uh, cardiac surgery. 
And I trained, I had a very solid cardiac, adult cardiac surgery training, and then they had a job in Belgium and I had my first child. Uh, I felt responsible. I wanted to stay in Canada, but I thought I needed to have a real job. And so I took the job and the job was to be part-time pediatric heart surgeon. And I was, I was a bit frustrated in Belgium and there was a critical moment where I was in the evening and my old professor of cardiac surgery who really liked congenital, he, he, it was his favorite you know, uh, uh, work. Um, and he was retired at the time. He sees me in the office and after a year of being there, he said to me, do you like pediatric cardiac surgery? I said to him, you know, there's no point of me liking or not liking it. We are centers, there's not enough cases, with two surgeons, there's no point in me liking or not liking it. No, no, but that's not what I'll ask. He said, do you like it? And, and I thought, I reflected and on the evening I came back to my wife and said, you know what? I think I'm going to train in pediatric cardiac surgery. And, and so, and so that, so and it is this snap moment where the guy made me think. And so uh, that's how I came, uh, uh, became a pediatric cardiac surgeon. And then I was frustrated because there was not enough cases in Belgium uh, for, you know, 11 million inhabitants. Uh, and it was divided in, in four centers. We were the biggest centers, but we had barely 120 bypass cases per year with two surgeons. So I was going into international meeting and I was frustrated. I looked at the video of the guys. I thought I can do better, you know, give me the patience. And, 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 and then there was a job advertised in Melbourne, Australia, which always had the reputation to create great technicians, great surgeons. Uh, the guys who were there had, had always very solid reputation and applied for the job and I was selected. And then within years, I, I, I achieved more quickly than I thought, my, my goals there. And now I'm an older guy. And so I think that I can, I can influence the field more. And uh, I think I'd like to try new things as well. And, and so I thought that the central position in North America was uh, uh, in, interesting for me. And so I was contacted over the years, the last few years by many, quite a few uh, big centers. And I was a good match with the Children's National in Washington. So I thought that, you know, there's a whole new generation of leader. You're talking about Thomas Spray, who uh, now retired. And so all the, the first generation of the big leaders who, who have made the field have retired. And so I'm part of the new generation. And so it's, a, it's, a, it's an exciting moment, I think, for pediatric cardiac surgery in North America. Yeah, that's definitely very exciting to, to see a new wave coming in and, and learning all the different things you can do. In your bio, following up on that, uh, you say, and I'm quoting you here, sometimes it seems like I've been born and put on this earth for that single purpose. I have to bring life to patients with single ventricle hearts or assist devices. And then you added, it's more like pediatric cardiac surgery chose me. So can you tell us a little bit more about that quote and well, why you decided to focus on single ventricle? So, so, uh... After that time, when I decided to become a pediatric cardiac surgeon, I went in training in a great Ormond Street hospital, De Laval, who was the main figure, who is a very big figure in the Fontan operation as well, uh, who, who designed the lateral tunnel, uh, was the chief there and, uh, and he had some connection with Belgium, so he, he decided to train me. And uh, in the end of the 90s, uh, we were discussing about what would be the solution for the Fontan. And my specialty, because my center in Belgium was very strong in artificial heart, a ventricular assist device. I did the first, um, I was a trainee there, but as a trainee, I put the first long-term, you know, artificial heart in children in, in the UK at the time, actually. And, and, and for me, the solution was obvious. I had to put them, uh, you know, the solution is, is, you know, mechanical assist device. And so uh, I came back, I did some animal experiments and I kept that idea for forever. And so I, I built up uh, uh, that program in Belgium. And I, when I moved to Australia, uh, I wanted to get to the, to the patients that, that would need an assist device. So I did some research and that's how I built the registry. And the back of my mind, I always had the same goal to put them on. Uh, and that's been, it's been, uh, you know, it was 98. So it's been 22 years I had that idea in my mind. Uh, you can say I'm persistent. Uh, but, and, uh, and so, uh, and, and, now, and now suddenly, you know, I, I couldn't find the patients that were sick because the main message of the research I've been doing is that 
they're actually doing much better than the people expected. So I expected to see a lot of patients that I could put on a vat, but you know, not many of them were, were needing uh, artificial hearts. And so, uh, and, and, and so now I'm the super specialist of the front hand circulation. I'm a specialist in artificial hearts. It's like the combination of, you know, so I have the combination of, of the clinical expertise. I, I was always exposed to single ventricle condition because I, I always work a lot. I was, or I was always there. I was the, uh, you know, one of the most senior surgeons. So I was, so I, I'm getting all the cases. I'm, I'm operating them all the time. I have the, 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 the science knowledge about this circulation and the expertise of that. It's like, I, I have, I'm one of the guy in the world who has the, that conjunction. And so I have 10, 15 years to work. I, uh, the time, the clock is ticking. Now it has to happen. Well, speaking of that, I know that a lot of times um, parents of, especially of single ventricle um, children, but all, 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 almost all types of severe forms of congenital heart defects, we also often feel like science just isn't working fast enough for our kids. You know, we want, to see things change faster. We're worried about the future. And so you've had all this experience, you've been doing this for a long time. What have you seen as some of the changes that have happened over the year and what gives you hope about the future for our kids? So um, in, uh, you know, in the end of the 2000, 2008 or so, I attended uh, meetings in the US where I saw a North American speaker in one meeting that I remember precisely two speakers uh, uh, rose and uh, stand there and say, uh, oh, you know what's going to happen with this front end patient. They're going to live into their 20s and they're all going to die. And I thought, that's, 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 that's not what I see. That's not what, I ha what happens. And so that's what you know, pushed me to uh, build the front end registry in Australia and New Zealand. And I think that if I look at my career, and I think the most important thing that I, I did was to prove that actually the outcomes after the front end operation were way better than everybody anybody imagined. And so the contribution of that work is to say, and if I, I say the, you know, the things that have changed now is that finally the people realized that, hey, uh, you know, beforehand everybody was turning their back and you know, it's annoying, it's a front end, single ventricle art, they're always bad and they always have problems and nobody was getting, you know, they were all turning their back to that population. And now it's there. We know, hey, they're not going to go away. They're a large population, but they have lots of problems. So we're going to have to do something about it. And so it, I'm not the only one to have contributed to, to that, but that, that's, that's part of the, the work that I've been doing. And so I think the exciting thing is for the first time, the people get exciting and we're starting to do the research. And so, so uh, we had this... Uh, I've organized in, in Bordeaux uh, because that was where the first Fontaine uh, operation was done, a think tank of, of the top shots of all the most experts in the world. And then following that, we, we had a, an HA statement. And so we finally have you know, 52 pages about the status of the Fontaine circulation in, circ in, uh, of the Fontaine circulation, in circulation the, the biggest you know, journal in cardiology. And for me, that was a sign, you know, okay, the people start getting, getting interested in it. And so there are no special section in surgical journals about Fontaine. And so we are at the stage where we only investigating what is happening. And so I agree with you, it's not fast enough, but we haven't tried a lot of things. And so we, we, we now finally have a pictures where the people are doing much better. And, and I have some recent numbers to give, but um, and, and it, you know, you can always take it on a positive, on a bad side, but if you have a kid that has arrived to your, the age of your kid, you know, 16 years of age with no big complication, the heart is functioning all right, the valve is functioning all right, there's no uh, 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 fast heart rate, you have a, a more than two third chance to reach the 60s, the age of the 60s, which is unimaginable compared to what the people believed, you know, 20 years ago. And, and, um, and so we, we're capturing the essence of, you know, you, the, the problems that we, we can get, but we have not yet started any intervention. The first two trials, one is ongoing and one is finished on drugs, have just taken place right now. 
So, so we, we just at the beginning, and everybody's excited about uh, artificial hearts and machine, but there's nothing much happening. But right now, there's two devices that have been designed for adults with heart failure. But while they design it, they thought both companies it could be useful for Fontan. There's some machines that we could use within the next year or two in failing Fontan patients. And so um, I, I do think that, yes, the progress was slow for a long time for this population, but that's going to accelerate now because there's more interest and there are things, things coming up. So. Well, that was helpful and exciting. So I really appreciate you sharing that. When uh, and we want to get to the registry in a little bit, but when you talked about the outcomes and the numbers of outcomes, are you do you see a difference between different countries um, in yeah. outcomes, or are you seeing a difference? Like, is has there been a big increase in in better outcomes recently? What are you seeing in that area? So, um, a, a yes and no. No, because I'm a scientist and I said, I don't have the numbers, so I cannot prove it. I cannot give you the, the real, but I know, I know the numbers. I mean, because I'm the, the Mr. Fontan, I get all the papers from everywhere in the world. So as soon as there's a word Fontan on it, I get them to review. And so I reviewed a lot of papers, so I can compare the results of different places. And I know the practices are different. So uh, I'm building up now, and that's what's one of my, my pet project is the, the, or the one of my most important projects for the mo moment is a, an international Fontan registry. So we're going to combine the data of the most, the biggest North American center. So we have an agreement from Toronto, Mayo Clinic, Philadelphia, uh, Ann Harbor, Michigan, Texas, who, who have all their follow up of all their patients with Australia, New Zealand, and some center in, uh, uh, so UK, Birmingham, 900 patients as well, and Munich, same, uh, 900 patients uh, in the day base. And that's one, it's not the only, but it's one of the questions, comparing practices. Honestly, it's not on the paper, but if you look at PLE, uh, protein-losing anthropathy, a typical complication of Fontan, the variation of the rate is, and, and that's very, it's a very good sign, I think, of of the, you know, the, the number of patients who develop that is a good sign of the health of your frontline population. And so some, and it varies between five and 20%. So you look at China, for example, uh, uh, I'm sorry to say, but it's 20% in some of the series, which is very high, but their patient is different. They, they operate at much later age in worse state. They don't have the follow-up that we have here. In Australia, it was uh, 5%, but it would be very interesting because the people do different techniques, they operate at different ages, they have different practice in terms of collateral, the cath intervention that you do before. So that's one of the goals. But I think the same way, you know, we, we made progress in cystic fibrosis under the influence of parent groups, by the way, I take always that, 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 that example uh, for the work that you have to do. But the, 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 patient from, the parents from the cystic fibrosis say we have to have the data from every, everybody to see. And, and if some centers are doing better than others, we were going to make their practice. And that revolutionized the, 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 you know, the, the survival of patients with cystic fibrosis. The, the, in 1963, I think the median survival for cystic fibrosis was three years of age. Now, these patients are living into their 40s and even beyond that. No new drugs, you know, no, no, no magic things, just a more accurate, precise management. And so that's, that's something that simple things that we can, we can bring uh, by just gathering a large number of data and comparing practices. So yes, I think there are differences, but we don't know anything about it. I just suspect there are, and the people are open now, it's difficult, but open to compare. So it's, it's getting there. So one of our, the later questions was about registries, but I'd like to bump it up because this is what you're talking about. A lot of uh, parent, I think it's hard for parents a lot of times to understand what a registry is and what it does. And I didn't know if you could, you know, you're talking about comparing all the data from different countries. Could you talk a little bit about the Fontan registry that you're looking at starting here and, and uh, what that does and how it helps patients and families? So, so we had data uh, from, um, uh, we had data for the what happened late after Fontan, but before we did the registry, the data were coming from 
uh, Mayo Clinic. Mayo Clinic for years, for example, did the absolutely worst candidates ever. And so they accumulated, so they experienced, they, they collected the worst candidate and so they, they, and then they led the field by trial and errors. And so it's not a criticism, but the, the, the Fontana worse. So the, um, uh, you look at the pediatric heart network uh, uh, studies, they were accumulating people who were volunteering uh, for the studies from very high end centers, people who would do the more specialized, the more difficult complex patients. And so that doesn't tell you about the Fontan circulation itself. Australia, New Zealand was a good breed, a good ground to study that because they start the experience actually a bit later than the rest of the world, which means that they had learned their lessons already. So they knew what not to do for a start. Honestly, they had very good technicians, very good surgeons as well. So technical uh, problems were not much of an issue. And then we grabbed the whole population. And so the importance of the registry is you know, we had 1,600 uh, 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 entries, and the last time I checked, I had 22 patients refusing to participate. So we had that on an opt-out basis, and that's what we're going to build up now. So we want to include big centers, and we want the entire population. We're not interested to have, you know, 30 out of the 300 patients that they're following. We want to have every time the entire population. And so what the registry gives you is that you you, you have the denominator. It, it's, you, you know, you... If you look at the, the sickest of the population, you understand what happens and the mechanism of it, but you don't know the relevance. Let me give you an example that is close to your heart. Uh, liver and kidneys. Liver and kidneys seems to be a problem. You know, when you have a frontal circulation, for those who don't know, you live with higher pressure in your veins. The way I compare it, it's not very fair, but as a kid, you remember, playing and you put your heads and grab on a branch or a pole or something, and you, you, you rest with your head down. And, and it gives you an idea of, you know, your head seems like bursting after 10 minutes. And, 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 and somehow that's what the fontan circulation does in a lesser measure to your organs. And so you see with time that you have issues with kidneys and with the liver. And so you have a buildup of, of scar tissue in the liver. And everybody got very excited about it. And yes, it's important to get excited because if you have a lot of scar tissue, that's the, the, the ground to grow uh, cancer. And so you, you, that's what you don't want. And so there were a lot of people, oh, they're all gonna end up with liver failure and cancer. Somehow, when you look at our data, uh, and that's an entire population, you know, all comers, our numbers was that uh, yes, 50% of the patient by the time they reach adulthood have some degree of mild degree of impairment on the kidneys or, or a bit of protein going through. But you look at 20 years later, it doesn't seem to bear consequences as it would normally in other adults. And for the liver, it, it was the same. So you, you, you had some abnormalities detected. But then if you look at the number of cancer, you have to follow I think 80 patients for 40 years to find one cancer. So that's more than in a normal population. But gee, you know, it's, uh, it's not an epidemic as they say. Yes, it's a problem, but you know, it, 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 it's not like everybody's got a Fontan has to be completely dead scared about the liver. So you, it, it gives you perspective of the important, the relevance of the problem. And so the people would dispute that and, and again, that would be interesting to compare from center to centers because of practice, you know, we had pretty good results compared to the rest of the world. Um, yeah, that must have answered your, your question, I think, no? Yeah, no, I think that's um, that really was helpful. And the example you gave about the liver, I think is gonna be super helpful to any um, patients or parents who are dealing with the Fontan uh, and liver disease because that definitely is uh, something you think about. But it, it, you really did, clearly explain how a registry can be a huge benefit in treatment yep. here. If I, if, I can, if I can push this on the liver and the kidneys, okay, you, you have to take whatever I say with a word of caution because, and it's part of the job, I think, I'm, I'm, I'm on the deliriously optimistic side most, most of the time. And so I know that I'm an optimistic and the, the people know that, 
but I know what I'm talking about. I mean, I have numbers. Huh? So I'm, I'm a number person and, and I base myself on numbers. But the way I, I think is that you remember when you, you know, uh, when you all bear food for the whole summer, you get a thicker sole of, uh, on, on your feet. And it's the same with the liver. I mean, you put the liver with a lot of pressure. So the liver has to do what it has to do. It builds up thicker soles, so it builds up scar tissue. Same for the kidneys. You know, the kidneys, you have a lower cardiac output, less blood coming to the kidneys, and more resistant afterwards. Of course, your kidney will not function normally, but we haven't defined the normal for a Fontan. So we can only compare ourselves right now to what is a Fontan compared to a normal individual. But they don't have the same circulation. And so that, that's, that, that's what we have to capture. And that's why you need entire healthy population, not the sickest one of the lot. Sorry, yeah. No, I, no, I do think that helped and it, it clarified for sure. So, uh, and, and we're excited about learning more as you move forward with the registry. So please keep us updated on that and, and let the parent advocacy, parent and patient advocacy organizations know what we can do to help out with that. Um, so in Mended Little Hearts, our three pillars are support, education, and advocacy. So I'm going to turn it over to Mary Ann because we have some questions for you about working with parent and patient advocacy groups and support. Thank you, Jody. Well, yeah, we have a lot of questions about support. And specifically, um, our Mended Little Hearts group here in D.C., um, has a very good relationship with the healthcare providers at Children's National, working together to support the families. How do you include parents and families as part of the care team after surgery? You, you say you have a very good relationship, but I haven't seen you yet, huh? No, I'm joking. I'm uh, we, not we're allowed talking... in. <laughs> sorry, but uh, 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 sorry. Uh, your question was about uh, how do, how do we. Um, how, how does the care team work closely with parents to improve outcomes? Specifically, how do you as a surgeon and cardiologist work with the families to improve the outcomes for going forward? So, so, so I think the way we can uh, interact is that, uh, and I'll give you the example of how I was working in Australia with Heart Kids. Heart Kids was a parent association for people with congenital heart disease and was very powerful. And so they, they were very organized and very powerful. And so uh, the, 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 the mission was to help the families, you know, say, say, same they knew, they were very present in the hospital. And so the way I describe them is like, you know, they, 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 they're their family in the hospital when you're away from home. So if you travel from far distance, they would uh, help you and give you, you know, tips and tricks and, uh, you know, be the shoulder on, on which you can cry and, and make sure that you, you know, but they would help for things like travel accommodation at times and, and practical things, not especially paying, but, you know, organizing it sometimes. And uh, um, uh, then they, they helped a lot in research. Uh, and so they, they did small grants, you know, the first uh, 50,000 Australian dollar for, for starting a project that would not attract funds from bigger uh, enterprises like NIH or NHMRC. Uh, uh, uh. And then they were, they were very good lobbyists. So they were good lobbyists with the hospital. And so uh, we, we had issues with the uh, waiting list uh, because we were overloaded. We had to postpone patients. Uh, it went in the newspaper, Heart Kids got in, and it got us a cardiac schedule coordinator. So they put pressure on the hospital to provide better care. They put pressure on the government as well. So they were the lobby group, they, they, they lobbied with the parliament. And so they, I think that what, um, what I'd like to uh, explain to parent groups all the time is that you should feel empowered at the end of the day, if I go as a doctor and I said, oh, I need this or that, or my patient needs this or that, yeah, it's important. If I'm a good doctor, they might listen to me. But if you as a parent group say, we're the consumer, that's what we want. There's something wrong here. You, you, know, you can change things. OK, I'll, I'll, uh, I'll give you a horrible example. Are you ready? But, um, uh, 
it's close to my heart, but I, I shouldn't say that. And it's the, it's not a criticism of the children's national. It's the same everywhere, everywhere I've been. So if you look at the, the we, we I worked very closely with the parents and families because of the Fontaine registry. We had education day every year, and I had I had lots of intimate discussion, uh, you know, on the long term with families. They were working for the registry. They were volunteering to even to get data, put data in a computer. Uh, the uh, if you, the, it, we made a survey of what was the most important for the families, and yes, for the families, the, the, you know, the, the, the fear of death is was the most important concern. Same for the patients themselves when they get into adolescence and adulthood. It, it, you live with that your whole life. But just closely beyond that, the biggest concern for parents and family were uh, psychological well-being, and for the and for the the kids. The young adolescents, well, they always think that they, you know, they feel fine. So for them, it was physical capacity to be able to compete with, you know, to, to, to do the same thing that their peers physically. If you look at the psychological well-being of adolescents and what influenced that, or if you look at the psychological well-being of the family itself, what influenced that is not the severity of the conditions, whether you have hyperplastic left heart or double heart left right ventricle or something else. It doesn't depend of the results you have, whether you have good, you know, you had good results from surgery, no complication, if you have good exercise capacity. It depends mainly of your experience with the hospital, your first contact with the hospital. And it's just so striking when I discuss with the families, mothers of, you know, young adults, the scars are remaining them for a lifetime. And, and I had this mom who was telling me uh, uh, about he, his son. And for years, she was telling me that she was going to the swimming pool and then everything was fine. And then another mom come on, uh, and say, oh, your, your kid looks too blue, too pink, too something. And the heart rate goes up immediately. There's this you know guilt coming and the whole it's like it's all coming back and and the story is so obvious i mean it's all consequence of you know equivalent uh, uh than post-traumatic stress disorder and so that has been studied and 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 it's um i told you i would talk about psychology but the the that has been uh, uh studied and and you can a uh, screen not everybody has that but you can you can screen mums during the hospital stay or at the end of the first hospital stay and you can score them you can score their resilience and it depends on things like did you have an antidental diagnosis what is the relationship of the mum with her own mum uh, what is the um, uh, type of support you have and so on and so forth and you can work on it so you go to a hospital and let's say about melbourne you, you look at the city do you think that there's a, a place in the city where you have as much uh, 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 suffering and psychological suffering than the ICU of a, a, a children's hospital. I don't think there's anything that is equivalent to that. And yet, when you, when you have distressed families, you say, okay, I'd, I'd like to just, you know, direct you to a psychological support. What you have, zilch. You have social worker which is doing a fantastic job, but no psychological support. How come you have the place in the you know in the main city in the children's hospital in the in the ICU? That's the place where you have the most intense psychological suffering, and yet you have no psychological support. You know you you have you 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 make the cost of a, a patient with a single ventricle in Australia it costs between 500 to 1 million dollar if you're doing well not if you if you're sick it's even worse and the psychological support would cost you 1500 dollars i mean it, it it doesn't make sense and so that's where guys like you 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 know you, i think that you you the advocate you want to change something it's in your hands if, if as a parent group, you go to the, to, to, to the, you know, you work closely with us clinicians and, and by working closely, we can change practice, I think. The life of families, the, the life experience through, through the hospital. I think the, the groups like yours are absolutely essential. Thank you, we, we think so too. <laughs> we actually have um, someone 
that wrote in from Melbourne. Um, and so thank you so much for uh, joining us all the way from Australia. And she wanted to um, say how sad they were to see you go and the relationships that you had with those parents was tremendous. And um, so, yeah, we're getting, we're getting some messages just saying how, how wonderful you have been with the relationships and, and building support with the family. So you surely are missed, but we are certainly happy to have you here now. Yeah, so we, uh, from, it seems like, um, I, lo I love your answers about working with parents and trauma and, and recognizing all that the parents actually go through because it's it can be so difficult and sometimes you feel like no one really is understanding what you're experiencing as a parent. And so it's really nice to hear you say that and acknowledge that. Um, and, but moving moving to a slightly different subject with a multidisciplinary clinic. So my son is seen in a multidisciplinary Fontan clinic and we have found a lot of comfort in that because people um, from very many different disciplines see him, but then when we get the information, it's all filtered through the CHD lens, right? So we can really, like you said, with the liver, a liver in a normal person isn't the same as a liver in a Fontan patient, right? So you need to think about different things in that. So what are your feelings about um, multi multidisciplinary clinics and some of the benefits um, and drawbacks of them? Can I ask you a question that I'm not sure you can answer? Sure, I think. When you go, and I'm very curious, it's a genuine question. So when you go to a multidisciplinary clinic like that, do you have a lot of out-of-pocket uh, expenses? Do you have to pay a lot or not? No, it's um, it actually ends up being less expensive than if we were to go to each um, specialist individually and pay each out of pocket for each, because all of the testing, like the um, get the GI, the ultrasound and everything, we were to go to each one and get our out of pocket co-pays and our out of pocket expenses, it would be more, much more expensive actually than going into the multidisciplinary clinic. That's very interesting. Uh, um, that's useful information because I don't know the health system yet enough in, in America. Okay, the, the, the thing that I'd like to, to specify is that uh, it's nice to have multidisciplinary uh, uh, clinic, but keep in mind that we don't know yet how we have to follow patients with a Fontan circulation. And so, so when we did this HA statement on the way we have to follow the, the patients, I insisted, uh, and, and you know, Jack Reichick from Philadelphia and myself were the, the, the leader of that initiative. And so I insisted that we put in a survey of all the examination uh, that uh, should, can be done in patients with a frontal circulation. Then at the same time, we did the same type of recommendation from Australia and New Zealand. There's a striking difference, but it's a public health system. And, and, uh, and honestly, what is an HA statement is uh, like uh, uh, what you, you know, sport, you ask to sport brat kids uh, in, a, in a toy shop what they want. And, and, and you know, that's the list. But I wanted to put it out there because I want the people to reflect on how far can you go to, to, to get there. The problem now is that a lot of people still uh, just do uh, the ECG and an echo. And the problem I can tell you about the problem in Australia is that uh, I, I looked, I still haven't managed to publish that paper. I don't think it will ever come out, but if, if you do uh, an echo every year to a frontline patient, on ultrasound of the chest, okay? And the patient has no symptoms. You just do as a checker. I mean, do, do you know how often you see something new that is changing even a tiny bit the treatment? Any idea? 0.8%, not even 1%. But if you do an MRI every three years, for example, well, it changed uh, something in, 10 to 15% of the cases. 
And so, yes, they were doing less MRI, so the reality may be less, but it's likely that it's more interesting to do one MRI, more interesting to do one MRI every three years than an echo every year. The problem is that in Australia, it's different everywhere, but the problem is in Australia, the cardiologists who are leading the treatment and the follow-up, well, they get not a penny from an MRI. They get paid for doing ECG and echo. And so you go to a gastroenterologist, you know, he's going to look into your stomach or your colon. You go to a cardiologist, he's going to do an ECG and echo. There's no reflection on, hey, how do you best follow the patients? We looked at, at, at renal function. I mean, three, two thirds of the patients had never the renal function tested, even by a blood sample at the time of the transition to the adulthood. So, uh, so, 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 you know, but then we haven't specified yet the best way to follow them. So I think that uh, one thing is clear. If you have a, a, a 15 to 25 or 15 to 30 years old, you want them to go once a year in the hospital in the shortest time possible, because otherwise they're not going to follow their treatment. You want to get them in follow-up, you, you have to do to be efficient and, and things. So you know, I think it, it's, it makes sense to have to have a multidisciplinary clinic, but between the super luxury uh, multidisciplinary clinic that you probably follow on, if I know where you are going, uh, you know, compared to the need for everyone, and, and what I'm more interested in is like bringing the optimal care to everyone. Uh, I'm not sure that the, 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 the one that you're going is the solution for every front time. I'm not sure that everybody should, should, should do that. That's, that's too costly for the health system, for the benefits that you get, I think. It is, you know, between doing an echo and ECG that's probably useless and this multidisciplinary clinic, you know, the real need is somewhere in between and it's not yet defined. Well, thank you. I, I would say it is, <laughs> but I'm biased because it, <laughs> I've had such a, they found a lot of, you know, things that we've dealt with there, but I, I hear what you're saying and, and, and definitely uh, would, uh, would. But there's a science, there's a science behind it. And trust me, I've looked at it. This, this very, there's almost no papers on the benefits of the, the, the checks that we do, of the investigation that we do. We very rarely look at uh, the rationality of what we're doing. And, and, in a, and that's why I ask for finance, because in a, in a finance limited health system, um, it looks like America, there's money everywhere, but uh, uh, in a, a financially restricted health system, you, you, you have to be reasonable that this consideration is important. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Well, that is a very interesting answer. So uh, we're going to move on to where I think Marianne's going to do one last question because you have a lot of questions in the Q&A. So um, we're going to ask about moving to our favorite subject these days of COVID. <laughs> COVID. We have lots of COVID questions, but we trying to narrow it down. Um, because many parents are obviously very concerned about their children who have CHD during this pandemic time. And we have heard that um, about multi-system organ failure in children who get COVID-19. Is there information that can help parents in regards to that that you can share with us and, and how it, you've seen it affecting kids with CHD? So. I have to disclose, I have no expert knowledge in COVID-19, but I will talk to you uh, as a doctor who's got kids. I think that's, that's and who's thinking about it. I think that the, um, the evidence, we were all fearing that the COVID-19 would be extremely dangerous for kids with congenital heart disease. And honestly, this evidence has not come up. There are things that looks pretty obvious. It's a bad idea to have a front-end circulation and to get COVID. You, you don't have to be a rocket scientist to have that. If you have a lot, a, a lot of AV valve regurgitation and congested lung, it's going to be a bad idea. Uh, you know, be, uh, it's going to be a bad idea to have COVID. But that's obvious. You don't, you don't need to be a rocket scientist to, to understand that. Now, uh, it, it's uh, an interesting condition. 
you know, months ago, I have to disclose something. I was waiting for this pandemic for, for, for ages. I'm a worst case scenario type of guy that comes with a job, I guess. But so the third week of January, you can wheel back the events. But for, for years, you know, in, in 2004, I bought Tamiflu, 10 boxes for avian flu at the time. And I worked with an, uh, an infectious disease specialist who was a worldwide recognized infectious disease people. And we talked about the pandemics and we were waiting for it. it I always look scrolled in the newspaper to the world news to see if in Asia there was some kind of epidemia of pneumonia or something. And so on, on the third week of, of, of January, I, I was on my way to the U, a, a meeting in the US. I phoned my wife to say, you know, this stuff in China looks serious. Go in the pharmacy and buy a box of masks. So that's the first thing that's going to disappear. That was the third weeks of, of January. So, so I'm a worst case scenario guy, and but I'm not completely dumb, I guess, on that case. But the the um, and I said a few months ago, you know about rheumatic heart disease. You have an angina, you make antibodies against the streptococcus B. And then it can attack the heart every time you have uh, another angina with streptococcus because it flares up the production of antibodies that not only attack the streptococcus, but attack your heart, your kidneys, your joints. And I say to, to you know, COVID-19, it's, it's a disease that is killing you a lot because of the inflammatory reaction caused to the infection. It's not a proliferation of the viruses, it's what your body does against it. And so uh, uh, a disease where there's such an immune reaction is interesting. And that's what we're seeing. And I had kind of not predicted, but you know, I thought that that's something that could happen like rheumatic heart disease. We don't know yet the impact of having repetitive infection with COVID-19, but something we, we see, I mean, the numbers are extremely small at this stage. There's no way that with the numbers there is, Anybody should be concerned about that, realistically. And, and there's, God knows, there's a lot of people who had COVID. There's not a lot of them who had COVID twice. But I still think it's a pretty bad idea to get it. Even if you're a young person and you feel invincible and, and, and you feel like you don't need anything. And if you have something, I mean, if you had congenital heart disease, it's a stupid idea to smoke. You know that, and so so it's a it's a stupid idea to get COVID as well. And that's what I try to tell my seventeen years old who's uh, escaped tonight, uh, half an hour away with I don't know who, uh, but uh, I was explaining that. And um, yeah, they should be more cautious. Um, well, I agree with you. I have a seventeen-year-old as well, and two older children and it just it, it is very very nerve-wracking for us and especially when you have a child with a severe chd so we have tons of questions for you and i don't even know that we're going to get to them all so mandy is on on to ask the questions so mandy if you will read the questions and sure um thank you yeah Let's start with Liz. Um, she was first. She said, can you outline what you are learning from the registry and what you hope to learn? Uh, 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 I'll start with what I hope to learn and what then I'll get to what I've learned because if you, and I'm sure a lot of you have uh, kids with single ventricle, I think it's an important discussion. What uh, is one of my findings of the last few years is that to see that the valve inside the heart uh, is leaking much more than anybody could have expected over the time of the life. I mean, if you have an unbalanced AVSD, it's like two thirds of those surviving from time by the age of 25. Almost half of those who have hypoplastic left heart. It's a, it's a very serious concern and we don't understand exactly why it happened and we don't understand exactly how to repair them because the repair are not working as well as we would like at this stage. And that's, and, and valve repair is one of my kind of uh, expertise. So I'm excited to work on it. I like this operation. And so, but I'd like to know at what stage we have to do that. 
uh, we demonstrate that if you have more than moderate regurgitation, that will more than double your risk of facing death or transplantation. But if you look at Australia, for example, 150 patients develop moderate uh, regurgitation leakage of their valve uh, uh, in the years after Fontan. And only 17 at the time of the study had an operation. So we have 130 patients who have that. We know it's bad, but we don't know when to operate them. But the problem is because most of the time when it happens, the young adults, they sometimes marry, they have a job, they don't complain of anything. And there's some risk with the operation. And so what I'd like, what I hope to discover is I want to know which patient should be operating at, at what stage. And that's what the International Fontaine Registry will bring me. So what I've learned from the registry that is of interest to you, I've learned, as I explained that, that the outcomes are much better. We delineate what the issues are with the kidneys and the liver. The things that we've learned, uh, which is amazing, is the, you know, the Super Fontan business. Have you heard about Super Fontan? It's a, it's a paper, the, the, the word is, the word is, is, is uh, we, we've put the, the words out first and, and uh, it's a good concept. Some people with a Fontan circulation have actually normal or knee normal exercise capacity. You measure that by an, an exercise on the bike and you, you measure the consumption of uh, uh, oxygen and production of carbon dioxide. And, and uh, the consumption of oxygen is, is like 80% of the predicted value or more, which is amazing. You have one ventricle and the people are able to exercise almost as much as they peer. Most of them, all of them were exercising on regularly. So that and, and um, the research that is not yet published, body fat composition. You know that if you, if you, you know that if you obese, well, you, your life is shorter. Interestingly, not as badly as the people could imagine. And you know, it's a few years on a scale of 76, 82 years, you know? So, so but if you are Fontan, if you have a Fontan circulation, it, it's bad, but it's not the same. If you, if you look at, at, at uh, the normal popula population with normal hearts, well, it's like, you know, if, if your weight uh, uh, increase, you normal and then suddenly above a certain threshold, the number of complication increase rise. With a Fontan, it's from the lower weight to the higher weight, you immediately have an impact. What it means that if you, if you want to have a good Fontan circulation, you need to be not only not obese, you need to be lean. You need to be lean and, 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 and fit. And so, so you know, we, we had the story of a, a guy in Australia, one of the super Fontan, normal, amazing exercise capacity. The guy wins lottery. The guy wins the lottery, and then he, be, he becomes a potato coach, goes to the restaurant, holiday, stop exercising. And within two years, his Fontan is failing. Picks up, you know, 20 kilo, that's it. And so, so uh, and, and that's one of the things, uh, practical things. That, that you see. So what, what I do, and, and you know, exercising is, is not easy for Fonda. It's more difficult than if you have a normal heart. You can do it, but it, it's hard work. And so the only way you, you get people to exercise, and I've worked with people working in obesity in uh, adolescence, general obesity, you have to work at an early age and you work, have to work with the entire family. So, so you... Um, so when I, when, I, when I see the people, even at antenatal diagnosis, I tell them, you know, if your kid has a single ventricle, the one thing you can do is, you know, exercise. I say there's three things you can do, exercise, exercise, exercise. And, and, and that's more potent than, than anything. And then I tell them at the first operation and at the second operation, but by the third operation, they say, yeah, yeah, we know, exercise, exercise. So, but, um, and, and uh, yeah, that's an important message. Great, thank you. The second uh, is a two-part question. Do you have a plan for single ventricle patients who have kidney and liver issues before? And also, will Children's National get a single ventricle program? So, so we have uh, we, we have built up now a single ventricle program. So we are a small team and we're gonna review all the single ventricle patients, uh, the positive, the negative, make sure that we're doing everything because, um, 
if you uh, if you want to, you know, single ventricle uh, treatment, if you look at it, okay, after Fontana, it's much better than people expected, but we still have a mortality. We're losing babies uh, from birth to the, to the Fontana, to the first few years of life. And the numbers have plateaued. The survival of hyperplastic left heart has improved until about 2005. And everywhere in the world, it plateaued. Philadelphia, Toronto, Australia, we don't break that ceiling. 30% mortality still, if you look at all centers, uh, for the first few years of life. And so if you want to break that, there's a few things. I think that my little artificial hearts will help uh, in, in small babies, and it's coming. That's something we're working on. Uh, but, but also, you have to have everything perfect. With this difficult single ventricle, you have solutions. but. There's no place for mistake. You cannot you know, try something, oh, it doesn't work and try something else. It has to be immediately the right operation at the right time. And, and that's why you need single ventricle uh, program. Make sure that you know, the shunt is not too big. We're doing the right thing. We're reviewing all the data so that the whole, it's fed back to the whole team and you have a stringent policy. That, that's how you get, you get, you get uh, uh, better results. Now for people with uh, a liver and a renal problem, it, it, it looks like in your question it was before Fontaine, but I suspect it's after Fontaine. Uh, and I, I hope I understand the question, but uh, for, for the liver, um, you need to uh, follow that closely and it depends the severity of it. And, and I don't think that we are starting to get an idea of the severity in Fontaine, but there's no easy way. It's like it, it's still more an art than a science. And for the kidneys, it doesn't, I've looked at it deep and hard. It doesn't seem to give a problem as you would expect from kidney issues in the in normal population. It does not seem to be a problem. I've looked at, at, the, at the, maybe in the future, and it doesn't seem, they don't seem to, to suffer from it much. Thank you. Um, she does clarify, and she said before the Fontan in the chat box. So, so before the Fontan, um, uh, it has been identified by the team of Philadelphia that even at the time of the Fontan, the people have already fibrosis. And that's normal because the people don't know about it, but you have venous congestion already before the Fontan. Uh, and I think that that's, that's why you have that. The, it all, it, it all a question of, of the importance of it. Uh, you, you, you have to make a, a judgment call of how bad it is because, and, and how much worse the front end operation will uh, uh, do on the, on the liver and the renal function. It, it's, it's an individual case. Uh, it's, it's case to case discussion. Thank you. Uh, Katie has a great question. She said, even with all the improvements that have been made to the three-stage palli palliation, ultimately it is still a palliative anatomy. Is there research into new or different interventions to a single ventricle anatomy that would resolve the defect? So um, I'm a bit of an advocate here, but uh, it, it's a palliation, but Jesus, you look at pe chronic pediatric conditions, uh, the stuff that they call cure that are far worse than having a Fontan circulation. Huh? So, so we can argue about the, I think we, we get, I'm, I'm sorry, but if you get into your sixties, yes, I know it's not 70 or 80, but there's still a lot of people in the sixties. We have to, uh, it's going to be the, it's going to be soon the opposite. If you say it's a palliation, you're going to have to prove it because, um, uh, but I'm, I'm contentious there. Um, <clears throat> I'll tell you about my, uh, there's, there's two, just two things. Uh, there's at the beginning and at the end. And I'll tell you about my, uh, my dream as well and what I'm working on. So I, I think that uh, artificial heart is a, maybe a solution for Fontan. What you see is that the Fontan circulation is a chronically deprived circulation. So, so because of the resistance of the passage of the blood through the lungs, it, it doesn't, you know, it doesn't load the heart. And so the, the heart is, is not pumping as much blood as it would be ready to do. Uh, and the lung as well do not have, have that much pressure. And I think that's why exercise is so good. 
because if you do exercise, every time you pump the, the muscle of your legs, you can see a pulsatility into the, the uh, uh, arteries of the lungs. It's amazing. So you restore pulsatility by exercise. And I think that's what happens is that it stretches out the pulmonary arteries and it loads the heart. So it stretched out the heart. So my idea is that I, I may be, day, I'm, I'm completely daydreaming. Huh? Okay, so don't listen to me, but uh, uh, I think that we're gonna make machines uh, that we could remove. Uh, and, you know, I see the time where the people are a bit sick, you know, oh, I'm a bit down, you make a calculation and scale, oh, you're on a 17 out of 35 or something and said, oh, we're gonna offer you a treatment. They're gonna go to the hospital, have a little device, put potentially, and this device are there and we blow the circulation, stretch out the pulmonary arteries and the lungs. We keep that for three months, six months, a year. We take it out and off you go. You're good for another five years. And every five years we do something. It, it sounds crazy, but I think there's, uh, uh, I'd, like to, I'd like to test the hypothesis. I, th I, I think it's possible, but, but uh, uh, that, that's delirious. I mean, you're asking for a dream, huh? uh, so uh, I'm giving you a dream. The other dreams on the, on the first, at the beginning is that, you know, people are, are think that if you put stem cells uh, in the heart, that may work. Maybe there's some interesting data. Um, I'm not into. I'm, I'm not a cell type of guys, but so so I'm supporting that research. We're doing it in a Children's National as well, but um, uh, I, I'm not sure that that that's going to happen. I think that's what is more interesting is that we can improve the steps before Fontan to put you in a stage where you're really a good Fontan, and then we integrate in the hospital cardiac rehabilitation program that push the people to do exercise. You know, if, if you and I, anywhere in the world, you go to Kazakhstan, uh, I don't know, Turkey, Colombia, if you have a myocardial infarction, you have a heart attack, you go to the hospital, anywhere in the world, you will be addressed to a cardiac rehabilitation program, which will teach you about a healthy lifestyle and sport. And it may work or not work, but you, you're gonna be addressed to them. We have congenital heart disease. It's probably five times more important. It has five times more benefits than, than for adults. Zilch, you, you don't have anything. And so you, you see, you, you, and okay, it, that's not what a surgeon should talk about. I should talk to you about magical operation, but you would have so much benefits by doing that, by integrating that to the care. You have to look at the whole person. Um, if you want to have a long life with a front end, that's that's what you have to do. Build up athletes. It's a, it's a very you know same than cystic fibrosis. You know you have cystic fibrosis. If you don't have physio three times uh, three times a day, it's not going to work. Huh? You you know collect the, the you know the stuff in, in in your lungs and 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 get infection. So. Thank you. We still have a few more questions that we would love to have answered. We just don't have the time. So we're, uh, Dr. Judicum, we'll probably get you to answer those after and we'll distribute them to all the registrants. Um, and I'm going to turn it back over to Andrea now to close this out. Great. Thank you so much. Um, I wanted to thank everyone for joining us this evening. It was a great hour of conversation. Um, Jody and Marianne, thank you so much for moderating and asking such great questions. And um, Dr. Judicum, thank you so much for spending this hour. Um, you have great insight and we appreciate you sharing it with us and um, being open and honest and funny. And um, we appreciate it. So thank you all for a great night and um, stay tuned. Thank you. It went by too fast. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Thank you. Bye-bye.